Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory Medicine brought to you by AACC and the Clinical Chemistry Trainee Council. View this and many more pearls as well as other free educational material at traineecouncil.org. Hello, my name is Rajivan Selvaratnam. I'm a clinical biochemist at the University Health Network in the Laboratory of Medicine program and assistant professor at the University of Toronto. Welcome to this Pearl of Laboratory of Medicine on Acute Kidney Injury. Acute Kidney Injury or AKI for short, is a common yet unrecognized syndrome, affecting up to 1.2 million people per year during hospital stays. AKI has been considered a syndrome with various factors that could underlie the severity and ideology of the disease. This heterogeneity of AKI ultimately contributes to adverse outcomes and increased cost to the healthcare system. The increased length of stay from AKI is on average 3.5 days compared to those that do not incur AKI which also translates to increased likelihood of death. Indeed, the death rate per year associated with AKI is more than breast cancer, prostate cancer, heart failure, and diabetes combined. When surviving AKI with complete or near complete recovery of kidney function, there is increased risk of developing chronic kidney disease, possibly at an accelerated rate of progression. Nonetheless, there is value in recognizing AKI in many instances for prevention and treatment. In simple terms, acute kidney injury can be defined as a sudden deterioration of renal function. How do you define sudden? And what is deterioration? These questions have been addressed by various consensus guidelines, including RIFLE, which stands for Risk, Injury, Failure, Loss, and End-Stage Renal Disease. RIFLE was the first consensus definition developed by the Acute Quality Dialysis Initiative. RIFLE was subsequently updated to Acute Kidney Injury Network with the intention to replace the term acute renal failure with the more appropriate term acute kidney injury since renal failure can be an outcome of AKI and to eliminate the use of estimated glomerular filtration rates from the diagnostic criteria. The most recent guidelines are from KDIGO, Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, published in 2012. Historically, there has been a wide variation on what constitutes AKI which made it difficult to compare results across studies, validate new concepts such as biomarkers, and overall hampered progress in understanding the syndrome of AKI. It is therefore important to have a universally accepted definition of what constitutes AKI and recognizing AKI in a consistent and familiar manner. This was the goal of Kidney Disease Improving Global Outcomes, KDIGO guidelines on AKI that will be reviewed here. All consensus guidelines, including KDIGO, have relied on two important diagnostic criteria to define and stage AKI. These include the following. 1. Reduction in urinary output. 2. Increased serum creatinine level. Either of these criteria can be used to define any of the three stages of AKI. Let's consider urinary output. Clinical laboratories are not typically involved in monitoring or measuring urinary output. But the reduction in urinary output is an important criterion for the diagnosis of AKI. However, this diagnostic criterion based on urinary output is sometimes unreported in literature. There is also a wide variation and inconsistency on how one monitors and measures urinary output. In general, as evidenced from this table, lower rates of urinary output are associated with increased severity of AKI. A common clinical criterion for evaluating AKI is that based on laboratory measurement of serum creatinine. The preferred method for serum creatinine should be based on an enzymatic method and not the Jaffe method, which in general has known to have greater imprecision and interferences. Using the serum creatinine criteria, the three stages of acute kidney injury are defined as follows. Stage 1 is defined as a mild increase of serum creatinine by 50%. In other words, from baseline measurement, typically within 7 days or less, there is 1.5 times increase in serum creatinine. Alternatively, an increase in serum creatinine by 0.3 mg per deciliter or 26.5 micromole per liter or more within 48 hours is enough to define AKI stage 1. Stage 2 is defined by evidence of serum creatinine increase by 2 times the baseline measurement. And stage 3 is defined by an even faster rate of increase of serum creatinine, specifically an increase by 3 times or more in serum creatinine from the baseline measurement. Alternatively, 
an increase to 4 mg per deciliter or 353.6 micromole per liter or more or initiation of renal replacement therapy, abbreviated as RRT, to find the most severe stage of AKI. In pediatrics or those less than 18 years of age, an EGFR that is less than 35 milliliter per minute per 1.73 meters squared defines the severe stage 3. Since AKI is not associated with any specific symptoms, and with the diagnosis dependent largely on laboratory-based measurement of serum creatinine, electronic alerts or clinical decision support systems can be implemented to streamline and automate AKI recognition. This involves computerized detection of changes in serum creatinine and electronically alerting the caregivers, including primary care providers, of the opportunity to respond proactively, possibly enabling early recognition, timely intervention, and effective follow-up. For example, a study by Al Jagbir et al. in 2017 at the University of Pittsburgh Medical Center has shown that implementing such an automated clinical decision support system improved clinical outcomes that resulted in reduction in mortality by 0.8%, a reduction in length of stay by 0.3 days. Dialysis use was also reduced by 2.7% in patients with AKI, which was most notable in surgical patients. These numbers may seem modest. But given the frequency of AKI and by study estimates, this translated to $1.2 billion in savings and more than 17,000 lives saved. Such an electronic alert system provides opportunities for optimizing and enabling prompt clinical management, which can be, for example, notifying the pharmacist and clinical team about discontinuation or dose adjustment to minimize nephrotoxicity and renal elimination. Clinical management can also be directed toward treating the underlying disease, as well as treatment of electrolyte disturbances, including the optimization of fluid balance and hemodynamics. Several risk factors for AKI have been associated with exposures and or susceptibilities. Susceptibilities are generally shared risk factors such as certain demographics and genetic predispositions, whereas exposures are specific patient-related risk factors. Notable exposures include sepsis, cardiac surgery, radiocontrast agents, and nephrotoxic drugs, among others noted in the table. To this point, we have relied on serum creatinine, an ancient marker for evaluating kidney injury. There are limitations with using serum creatinine, which is known to be a delayed marker, requiring more than 50% loss of renal function. Therefore, while serum creatinine may be a good marker for epidemiological studies, its suitability at bedside for assessing AKI has been questioned. Also unclear are indications on frequency of serum creatinine measurements in general, although in passing the KDIGO guidelines does note that serum creatinine should be measured at least daily in high-risk individuals. However, this may lead to missing the observation of smaller changes in serum creatinine. From current guidelines, we know that even small changes in kidney function are important as there is a strong association with significant short and long-term outcomes. But how small of a change is significant? A few studies have demonstrated that changes smaller than those recommended by the guidelines are important. For example, even a 0.1 mg per deciliter increase was associated with increased risk of AKI, as shown by Newsom et al. in their 2008 study of cardiac surgery patients. In another important study by Chu et al. that evaluated retrospectively 303 patients with common histologic evidence of AKI noted that using serum creatinine criteria alone, only 185 of the 303 patients had creatinine changes that met the guideline requirement. This improved slightly when urinary output was factored in, but approximately one-third of the patients still did not meet the clinical criteria of AKI diagnosis despite histopathological evidence. The reasons cited by the authors in majority of the discrepant cases were a slower serum creatinine increase than that required by AKI definition from KDIGO. These indications contribute to the notion that serum creatinine is not an ideal marker. However, the changes based on serum creatinine as indicated in the KDIGO guidelines enable a universal recognition of AKI in a familiar and consistent manner while the search for novel markers that provide earlier indications are established. If we look at the current paradigm of how we diagnose AKI, it is at the late stage, where the damage has already occurred. That is, in a symptomatic state, as evidenced by decline in EGFR 
and increase creatinine. Therefore, the current approach is reacting to manage the damage that has already been done. A proactive approach may be one where biomarkers are present early in an asymptomatic state, reflecting not cellular damage, but instead impending damage or cell stress. Therefore, a proactive approach to anticipate AKI occurs in the asymptomatic state may involve new predictive markers in conjunction with risk stratifications and possibly tailored to specific susceptibilities and exposures of AKI, such as sepsis or cardiac surgery. Several markers have been investigated as early indicators of AKI. On one hand, you have the classical or conventional serum markers that reflect decreased glomerular filtration, such as creatinine and cystatin. On the other, you have urinary markers that have recently been brought to light as early indicators of AKI and proposed to reflect renal tubular stress and injury leading to AKI. These urinary markers include tissue inhibitor of metalloproteinases 2, abbreviated as TIMP2, insulin-like growth factor binding protein, abbreviated as IGFP7, neutrophil gelatinase-associated lipocalin, abbreviated NGAL, urinary albumin, liver type fatty acid binding protein, abbreviated as LFABP, and interleukin-18, or IL-18. The advantage of these markers would be their rise in the pre-injury phase leading to AKI, which enables preventative and protective interventions, such as reducing exposures to renal insults. A few studies have indicated that these urinary markers of AKI are earlier reflections of renal damage than conventional serum markers. Note that typically, serum creatinine will take 24 to 36 hours to rise after a renal onslaught. The table below summarizes the kinetics of some of these novel markers for comparison. For example, KIM, or kidney injury molecule 1, peaks within 48 to 72 hours post-injury, but is detected earlier at 12 to 24 hours. Interleukin-18 peaks within 12 to 18 hours, but is detected as early as 6 hours. If these kinetics are slow, then consider that NGAL and LFABP, both of which peak at 6 hours. Despite the earlier detectable presence of these markers in urine, what remains unclear is if serial sampling is necessary, much like in the diagnosis of acute myocardial infarction using troponin. Several promising studies have explored the potential for these early urinary biomarkers of AKI. However, additional studies are needed to define how they will be incorporated into routine clinical practice. Currently, it's not clear at what time points and frequency the new markers will need to be measured. And are these markers personalized to a specific AKI exposure such as sepsis? Or are these markers independent of exposures and susceptibilities such as pre-existing chronic kidney disease? How the kinetics will change in the context of pre-existing chronic kidney disease is unknown. While many questions remain unanswered, New biomarkers are much needed for early detection and management of AKI. In summary, the universal criteria for diagnosing AKI is currently defined by changes in serum creatinine and by urinary output as recommended by the KDIGO guidelines. The intention of KDIGO guidelines was to raise clinical awareness and stimulate research to improve both clinical care and patient outcomes globally, which can be accomplished when AKI is recognized in a consistent and familiar manner. AKI is clinically heterogeneous, as it is a syndrome that is highly variable in severity of presentation, etiology, and timing of the acute insult. This heterogeneity of AKI allows it to be underrecognized, making it costly to the livelihood of the patient and financially to the health system. Therefore, the future of AKI diagnosis may rely on novel predictive markers that anticipate and prevent AKI to enable optimal management as dictated by proven clinical outcomes. Thank you for joining me on this pearl of laboratory medicine on acute kidney injury. Thank you for joining me on this pearl of laboratory medicine on acute kidney injury. For more like this, as well as articles, podcasts, and more, please visit the Trainee Council at traineecouncil.org.